Thank you everybody for joining us today. I'm Josh Gross. I work at Common Room. We're a platform for creating vibrant communities, measuring their impact and unlocking the value across your organization. I am super excited for the session we have today. I considered calling the Guinness World Records prior because I think we have the largest communities on earth in this session. Um, some that are actually present on every single continent, another with over 30 programs and 20 platforms, and one that even gets over 3 million views per month just on their community homepage. And so to start this off, this community without compromise, so talking with some of the community heads for the most high scaled, largest communities on the planet, um, let's go into intros. So to kick this off, why don't we just give a little background of ourselves specifically, introducing who we are and um, how we got into community, because I think we all kind of take this windy journey into the space. Why don't you start, Michael? Thanks. And thank you very much, Josh, for organizing this. I'm super excited to be here, especially with these esteemed colleagues from uh, other companies. Uh, I'm the head of XM Community at Qualtrics. Uh, I've been working in the online community space since 2006, and I fell into the world of online communities rather accidentally. Uh, I grew up bilingual and bicultural in English and German, and I, ac I actually began my career as a, an ESL teacher, and I was working in the Bay Area and looking for a career change, and I wanted to get into tech. And I found a company that was looking for a German-speaking community manager. And that's essentially how I got started. And here I am. Nice. Well, glad to have you, Michael. And Ray, why don't you go next? Well, yeah. Well, thanks, Josh, again, for having me. Um, I'm Intel's Global Head of Community, where I oversee the community practice. And, and more recently, I created the Community Center of Excellence as well. Um, I started by bringing community managers, social media community managers, to monitor conversations, provide insights, engage, and curate content for some of our programs. And then, you know, that was 10 years ago, more than 10 years ago. And more recently, we started expanding our scope to true community platforms like Reddit, Discord, GitHub, um, and et cetera, et cetera. Amazing. Uh, we're already up to 25 years of experience in community. <laughs> Dottie, can you add to that? Sure. So first of all, Josh, thanks for having me. Uh, Donnie Weinstein here. Great to see uh, Ray and Michael. Um, honored to be here with these other great leaders. Uh, I have another 15 years to the mix here. So back to 2008, uh, I started my community journey at Hewlett Packard. Uh, I had a long career there, mostly in the support and services world and consumer support. I did every, pretty much every role under the sun, all customer facing. And back in the day, we had a charter to build out a branded you know, forum. We didn't even call it community. And so I was uh, fortunate to be on the ground floor of the uh, HP social care team, one of the original three. Uh, we launched seven language communities in 15 months. And really that last seven years at HP was my ABCs or my uh, you know, masters of community management, you know, with, you know, access to people like Joe Cothrell teaching me the ABCs and how do we grow and scale large communities. Uh, that's really where it all began. And since then been doing that, not only in the B2C world, but also to unicorns B2B. And now I'm, you know, really excited and honored to be working at SCP to help drive the vision for the future of this uh, wonderful community that they have. Amazing. Glad to have you here, Donnie. Uh, to kick it off, I think uh, we should get to the most controversial topic that we might cover today, although there are quite a few. Um, interestingly, the catalyst for this, this webinar was a conversation I was having with Michael. And he made a comment that where he said, I despise the word community. I think it's actually holding us back. And so why don't we start the conversation by defining community? Because I, I think saying scale and saying 3 million visits it, it carries a lot of connotation. We all try to internalize it, but what does it really mean? And so, Michael, why don't you start with defining the community for Qualtrics mm -hmm. and the Exxon community? And why did you make that statement? Can you elaborate on it? <laughs> yes, absolutely. And I just want to be extra clear that uh, I do not despise our industry or the work that we do. <laughs> Uh, it is simply the word community that I have a problem with. Um, at Qualtrics and at most of the other um, brand communities that 
uh, I have worked for, community has, de has been defined rather simply and rather broadly as our uh, community of customers, our community of users that we're trying to build relationships with. I personally view brand communities as a function of um, building real, authentic, and tangible relationships. And those authentic and tangible relationships translate into enormous business impact um, that can be measured in uh, a number of ways. One of the reasons I don't like the word community is that, A, it is not immediately obvious to other people, including many, many leaders in companies that have brand communities, what community is. For example, if you say I'm in marketing, if you say I'm in finance, if you say I'm in payroll, if you say I'm in sales, people immediately understand what the function of those departments are, even if there are uh, subdivisions or segments within those groups. Community, on the other hand, does not immediately convey the enormous business value that we bring to companies. And as a result, community can sometimes be backburnered or given fewer resources than community teams actually deserve. Uh, for me personally, I think one of the things that you and I discussed, Josh, is that I feel the word community itself feels, uh, and other people may disagree with me, and I welcome that disagreement, but the word community to me feels slightly immature. And I don't think we're doing ourselves as industry leaders any favors uh, by um, marrying ourselves to that word. I think there needs to be a better word or definition that more accurately conveys, uh, as I said, the immediate business value of what community is. Um, I'm not going to propose today what those alternate uh, terms might be, um, but that's just something I see. And um, I, I think that it's a, it, it's a, it's been a problem at least since 2006. It's been a problem in virtually every company that I've worked for. Being a community manager or community leader means very often justifying your existence, explaining the work that you do, constantly explaining the value of the work that you do uh, more than other groups have to do. So there's an extra burden, I feel, on community leaders when it comes to um, accurately conveying what we bring to the table. Yeah, and I appreciate you elaborating so you don't get that sound bite that you despise community. <laughs> I absolutely do not. I've dedicated my life to online communities and I, I plan on sticking with it. Uh, and I, I, I feel passionate about the world of online communities and the power that online communities provide. But I think that we need to, uh, as an industry, explore alternate terminology. Yeah, it's interesting. Last week, I was speaking with a chief marketing officer, and um, he was providing services to a lot of CEOs in terms of uh, understanding this whole community-led growth. And he mentioned that a lot of CEOs are asking about community, and they're like, we need to invest in community. We need to invest in community. And the first question I had was, what do they think community is? And so, Ray, yeah. I'm curious from your perspective, how do you define community and where does it roll up within your organization? I love the thinking there, Michael, and I agree with almost everything that you said. Um, community for us start with you know passion, with um, common themes or anything that those people have, uh, you know, that makes them uh, bend together, get together, right? Um, and it's about that interest, that that topic. It's about sharing, collaborating. It's about value exchange and relationship. That's mm -hmm. that's how we ground ourselves, right? Um, but I think one thing that um, I get surprised when I go to an event or when I'm discussing with people, because sometimes I feel that people are talking about community as a place, as a, a one forum, as uh, a location, right? It's it's to us. It's not about that place. It's about that group of people bended together, um, and they can congregate in multiple platforms. 
Um, and, you know, we could be in a support forum. We could be on a external platform like Discord, right? Um, and it's about that group of people that we can then collaborate. We can build things. We can help them advance their career. We can, you know, um, build relationship with across multiple platforms. And that's when I think a solution like Common Room plays an important role. Thank you, Ray. And Donnie, uh, how do you define community at SAP? Yeah, so even when, when we, I begin to talk about community, it's really, especially in, in branded you know, communities, because depending on, on how you slice and dice it, it can mean different things to different people. But in the context of business, uh, it's really the ecosystem of how your current customers and even your prospects have a, a relationship or an affinity with your brand. And so it's not just the online branded domain, you know, community.sap.com, which, which is sort of the hub that you own and drive and wish every single person would only, or that would be the place for them to engage in. But the reality is, is that many people have their own choices of where they prefer to interact, whether that be out on Twitter, LinkedIn, GitHub, et cetera, YouTube, to you know, in-person meetups and the entire ecosystem of user groups. We have a massive ecosystem of user groups around the world. And many of them not even run, run by SAP, they're run by other corporations that do it for us. Uh, but all of those interactions are, you know, the, the common theme is really the community of people having a conversation about SAP. How do I get, you know, and again, the B2B, there's really three flavors of conversations. There's the trad traditional q and I need an answer to a question. I have a problem that's support related or I'm trying to figure something out. Number that's number one. That's usually the largest percentage. And seconds around, I figured out something really cool, and it's not in release notes. And I, have, I figured out a new use case, and I'm excited about it. And I want to share it with my peer, with my people. And so that's around best practice discussion. And the last one is around ideation. It's really the voice of the customer, because in many cases people get stuck on getting an answer or figure something out. And they realize, oh, that's a great idea for a future request. So. I see it as the whole ecosystem. Uh, fortunately, where, where I sit today, community has actually been brought together under the umbrella of learning. The number mm -hmm. one reason why uh, people participate and come to um, B2B communities is to learn and grow. Mm -hmm. you know, they're using the platform for their job. They want to get better at, use, at do, using your platform for their work. And so it's a natural fit. And so our management and our leadership sees this as the on the on ramp, the gateway to enable learning. And we've got some pretty aggressive goals to upskill millions of SAP professionals in the coming years. And this is certainly one way to do that with the great traffic we have in our community. I, I like that response, especially because it, it talks to the goals and understanding like where your community team rolls into the organization, what you're set mm -hmm. to achieve or dis, uh, what the company has deemed the value you're gonna provide. Each of you have kind of joined new roles or helped define the role that you're in. Um, let's talk a little bit about like what those early days were, or perhaps even like when you do go back and do a retrospective on how you're doing as a community team. Donnie, you started about a year ago at SAP. Mm -hmm. What what did the first first ninety days look like for you, and like how did you prioritize understanding this ecosystem? and the impact you wanted to make first? Sure, it was actually quite interesting because again, the community, the SP community is now celebrating its 20th year. It's got a, a huge footprint. It's a very well oiled operation and certainly there's a big opportunity for us to make it even better. Um, but I was actually asked by very senior management all the way up to the board to actually take the first two weeks to just kick the tires on the experience with my personal laptop, my Gmail account, and really look at it from a consumer perspective. And uh, I uncovered quite a lot that I was even surprised about. So I presented that to them. And, you know, with that, uh, it really, from that point, kind of dove into, you know, there, there was already a, a version 1.0 that it had been in final stages of a five-year strategy. At that point, I started going into that, but looking at, you know, what are the big things we need to work on in 23? Uh, and so right now, you know, a lot of that work is really folded into some of the, the big pillars that we're trying to, to knock down uh, this particular year in 23 and also uh with those learning look at all right what are the things that as we get through this foundational work we're going to do this year what are the things that we need to do in 24 to really get to the next level of um what i would say you know creating a much more uh personalized and fun 
experience, but also have a better uh, symbi symbiotic relationship with our learning experience today. And in the future. I, it's, it sounds like uh, tactically, the first thing you did was you got your hands dirty. You, you got into the shoes of what a community member or somebody that wanted to engage in this ecosystem would look like. Mm -hmm. Do you think you would have been nearly as successful without doing that? I think eventually I would have uncovered some of those things, but having that up front certainly helped a lot because uh, having a fresh perspective and digging into some of the data that I was able to uncover um, was actually pretty eye-opening, not only to me, but to, to some of the senior management. And that's, that actually also was good uh, data that, that we leveraged to make some critical business decisions, you know, later in 20, at the end of 22. And they're now setting us up for success this year. Michael, you also, when you came into the role at Qualtrics, you also made some big mm -hmm. changes. Uh, what was the yeah. process you went through in terms of determining what you needed to prioritize and then um, how you actually went and executed against it? Yeah. Well, similar to what Donnie described, there was definitely a discovery process that took place. Um, I think it's pretty clear for everybody on this call that there are different types of communities um, the Qualtrics community historically has been a peer-to-peer -peer, uh, support community, and we wanted to look at um, what else is possible. How can we mature and grow this community into a real destination for a true 360 Qualtrics experience? So beyond just looking for answers about how do I do X, Y, Z in Qualtrics? Making sure that you are staying up to date on news, product releases, thought leadership, learning content. Uh, so we've been we've embarked on a journey that has taken us um, some time to to implement and to truly um, uh, strategize in a really smart and thoughtful way. Obviously, Qualtrics is a survey company, so naturally we surveyed our community extensively to ask them, uh, what are your needs? We want to make sure that we are tailoring this community to what is of value for you. Uh, we want to make sure we are building relationships for you. We want to make sure we are creating an experience for you. Qualtrics is also an experience management company. And so we would be remiss if we did not take that into consideration in our community strategy. So those early surveys that we conducted, as well as one-on-one -on -one interviews with community members were extremely informative in helping us to define our community strategy. So uh, I, I think that we've been quite successful in the uh, year and a half that I've been here in creating a community that is now uh, something that has uh, morphed and evolved beyond just a, a support community for people to find help and get answers about how to achieve certain functions in Qualtrics, but also to connect with others, build relationships, learn from other community members, uh, put community members in the spotlight um, to share their success stories, to talk about problems that they've overcome and solutions that they've implemented. Um, we have expanded our groups categories so that we can have custom segmented industry specific conversations. And we've also implemented an expanded rank and rewards program within our community to incentivize and reward participation. The first several levels of our rank and rewards program are primarily merch based uh, t-shirts, other types of merchandise. You would be surprised at what people will do for a Qualtrics t-shirt. And then the higher levels are really about uh, learning and development. So the, the higher mm -hmm. the level you achieve, the more access you have to free private time with our XM Institute, uh, XM Catalysts, mm -hmm. XM Scientists, private Ask Me Anything sessions with Qualtrics product experts. It, all of the upper level rank and rewards categories and levels are designed to uh, help customers be successful and loyal to the product long term. Amazing. It seems like you, you've you not only changed from just the support community in terms of the approach, but you also did it alongside and with your community, mm -hmm. creating a program that actually speaks to what they're looking to get out of it. 
Yes, absolutely. Personalization is very, very key in what we do and our approach to the community. Great. And Ray, you probably have the most complex community in terms of brands, types of communities, practice, hobbies, uh, product, brand, et cetera. Um, You just went through an audit yourself in trying to understand the shape. What was the purpose of that audit and what did you find? Yeah, oh, that's a good question. Um, And I love the thinking, Danny, about the ecosystem. Um, So basically to answer your question, Josh, uh, six, six, seven months ago, we created a center of excellence, right? It's a central body to build standards, enable, support anyone touching community at Intel. Um, And we did that because the volume of work and the things we were seeing was tremendous. And we we saw people creating new, uh, you know, bringing new platforms on board and then creating new programs. And then we decided to create that that group um, to help others. And then the first, one of the first things we did was, let's take a look at everything that is out there, all the different programs, platforms, audiences, resources, everything that we are doing around community at Intel. So that once we have that map, okay, then we can we can manage, right? Um, it's hard to manage what you don't know. We kind of knew what was going on, but then the audit, I think, helped us to have visibility on everything. Audit, we are starting to bring people together to have discussions about, okay, do we need this community? There is another group that is doing something similar. Can we merge those two things, right? Or we might not have the resources here, but we have resources in another place. How do we merge those two work streams and then drive some efficiencies? So those are kind of the discussions that we are having right now. Um, it was eye-opening. It was a surprise um, for us to, to identify that we had, you know, all those different programs across all the business units around the globe, right? So now that we have that map out, we can take action. And that's that's pretty much what we are doing. Nice. And what do you, would you say the benefit to stakeholders has been in terms of understanding the makeup of community, the definition of community, where it plays a role within your organization? I think there, there was always the challenge um as michael was saying why what's the value Mm -hmm. of community why are we doing this Mm -hmm. and and then what are the best practices so we as a central body we are helping them to materialize to land not just what community is best practices how do we do this how do we do that um so i think there is a lot of there are many services we are providing that um, all those stakeholders are seeing value but now that we're going through the audit and looking at all the data and those insights with them, they are also seeing value just by, you know, having visibility. And then as we collaborate with others, they say, okay, yes, we could probably do more with less. Or if we bring all these two teams or community programs together, we might end up getting um, more, um, you know, better ROI or whatever it is. So I think there is value by us as a central organization providing mm-hmm. the standards, yeah. um, but also by bringing two people together, by connecting some dots internally, right? So there is definitely a lot of value there. And there's a question that's pressing on this as well, is how are you sharing those insights or that audit with the team? Like, how are you sharing the plan um, and, the, and the, what you've learned through this process? We had a massive session yesterday, uh, one hour and a half, um, where we talked a little bit about the data itself, but then we had 30, 40 minutes just in different uh, breakout rooms um, thinking about, okay, how do we look at that data and then better align with our vision, with our goals, what we are trying to achieve, right? Mm -hmm. Um, Is there anything that we as a group can do different? So I think... Um, I don't want to come up with, you know, a solution by, you know, myself and then just talk down and then say, that's how we're going to approach things moving forward. We are building that collectively as a team, also because I don't manage some of those problems. Most of those problems are managed by the business units, by the different groups. So I can't, I can't provide a recommendation. I can try to influence, 
But ultimately, what we are trying to do as a center of excellence by bringing people together and as a team, um, come up with what's best for Intel and for their communities as well. Great, right? And that kind of talks a little bit more about um, a topic that for me, it creates like an emotional response is this idea of value capture versus value creation. Because like that immediately kind of connotes or like it has the connotation of yeah. that you're extracting from your community. Um, I'm curious from your perspective, Michael, because you've, when we, were, when we spoke the first time, what I noticed was you did an exceptional job in identifying what data would be valuable to which stakeholders. How do you think mm -hmm. about value capture? So what you're getting from the community, but also what you're giving back and making sure that there is some sort of equilibrium in that. And does it even matter? It absolutely matters. Uh, it's, it's absolutely crucial. Uh, I think I, I look at those two topics on different planes and levels, however. Um, if I'm looking at it strictly at the level of what's the value I'm bringing to our community members, I'm looking at, at that in terms of content value, whether it's instructional content, informational content, content that's designed to engage and build relationships, content that's designed to elicit a response from members. And then we measure those, those metrics internally in terms of um, engagement, monthly active users, things like that. When I'm looking at the value that we, I would say are required to prove out at the leadership level, for example, uh, I'm looking at a completely different set of, of metrics. Um, I do share the engagement metrics and I 100% share what's of value to community members. And I always make it very, very clear to leadership and anyone who will listen in every community job I've had that this is an altruistic exercise. Communities are a benevolent resource that you offer to your customers. Communities are not lead lists. Communities are not a barrel for your sales team to go fishing in. Uh, communities should not be sold to. Communities are for relationship building, solving problems, helping your customers. That being said, there are certain types of metrics that leaders want to see uh, because quite frankly, that's the way leaders think. Uh, a lot of times leaders think in terms of dollars or financial bottom lines. And so uh, we package up certain types of metrics in a way that meets that need um, without getting into the specifics of exactly what we share and exactly what we measure. Um, so I hope that gives you some indication that there, there is... Um, a push and a pull to both of the types of um, measurements. And you have to look at them on, at least from my perspective, on different planes. But one thing that's common between both is I always make it extremely clear that community is a benevolent exercise. It's an altruistic, altruistic exercise. We are here to help and support our customers, in our case, uh, as a brand community, first and foremost. So I'm guessing one of your metrics isn't sales leads. <laughs> You're Correct. <laughs> um, Correct. I mean, I will say one of the things I look at, but I do not report on or measure myself on uh, is um, uh, leads that are organically generated through the community. I think one thing that a lot of people don't realize is that um, relationship-based um, opportunities uh, are much more powerful and arise much more often than you might think mm -hmm. in terms of business. And I've seen that at virtually every corporate brand community mm -hmm. that I have worked for that was not an advertising supported community. So we have a Tableau report and it does show the originating page path 
for an opportunity and if that opportunity closed and there absolutely are sales that arise from the community. However, that is not a success metric for us. It's just something that we look at and hold in the palm of our hand and hold at a distance and say, wow, that's interesting that that happened. And that's it. We do not measure our success based on that, but it's something that we look at. So we have an awareness of what's happening on the community. That's interesting. I, I think, Donnie, um, you mentioned early on about the multi-year goals that you have for your community. And huh? one of the challenges that I see in setting expectations internally um, in terms of what the ROI is going to be for community is the time windows, because we all these talk about community being the long game. Sure. Um, uh, here, like from conversations that I have, we talk a lot about leading and lagging indicators and the relationships between them. So when mm -hmm. someone comes in, asks a question, they are blocked, they're trying to activate on the product, they end up consuming and buying, and now you can see that relationship between the activity and community and an outcome for the business. For mm -hmm. you, how do you manage those expectations across stakeholders, especially when you're looking at goals that are so far out, such as like activating the next wave of early develop or people that are early in their careers as developers. Like how do mm -hmm. you actually set those expectations and make sure that you're keeping stakeholders along for the ride? Sure. And then again, it, it, uh, many of the, the metrics and value add for community really depends on where you are in your community life cycle and journey. So, I mean, if you're just starting out, <clears throat> you look at it one way in the case of SAP, it's been around for 20 years and, you know, there are very clear, clearly defined, measures that are funding the operation pretty well today, particularly around support deflection. Uh, but it's much more than that. And it goes back to the relationship building. And so because of where we reside in the organization, again, under learning and seeing the symbiosis between why people participate, why B2B professionals participate in, in, a, in, a, in our community, it really is to learn and grow. So those goals are very much aligned with the 35,000 foot level goals of growing and upskilling professionals. Um, you know, again, the 99% of the people coming to our community are there to learn. They're trying to figure something out and get better at their SAP game. And so it's very much tied to that. And so we have to figure out how do we make it a much better experience, a much better integrated experience so that, you know, as they're reading up on a particular topic around, let's say, S4HANA or BTP, you know, we're serving up. Um, you know, people like you actually would be interested in this knowledge based article, or by the way, we just launched this, this offering in our learning center. That's very much related to, uh, someone like you, again, if we've got, you know, if you've got a well-oiled machine, fully integrated CRM with Marketo, et cetera, everything in, in, in the wheelhouse, which in fact we don't have today, we're getting there, but we know, okay, Michael's now signed in. He's been with SCB using SCP for five years. We know which products he's been using and he just. Uh, downloaded or just deployed, you know, version 8.2. Well, guess what? It's just like you're going to Netflix or, or Amazon. You're going to be served up with people like you actually would be interested in reading this book or watching this movie. It's the same thing. This would actually help you in your, it's, it's suggestions for improving you as a SAP professional. So that's really where I see the, the, the biggest value add for our community. If we're able to do that, again, it's all the traditional stuff of, all right, trying to figure this problem out. How do we get the information? Um, or, you know, best practices, but at the end of the day, it's about getting better at their, at using our products. And we know that if you look at any company, and it's, I've seen this in past roles and, and also in, in trading notes with my peers, like anything else, this is true of community. It's true of learning. The more that you can make your, enable your customers to better use your product, guess what? They're going to have greater demand for it, greater thirst for it. That drives better sales. It, 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 it mitigates the risk on churn. And it makes your uh, accounts much more likely to upsell and retain, especially in a, a cloud world where, which we live in, in a SaaS environment. Super helpful. I, I would love to keep this conversation going in terms of questions that I have, but I know there's a lot of questions out from the audience as well, and some starting from our community on Common. Um, let's start with the first one. Uh, and I think... I'm going to go with Donnie on this one because I know you've done both small and large communities starting from scratch. Uh -huh. What's been the biggest challenge scaling to a community of this size? So you had experience at Domo previously. Uh -huh. Now you're taking over as well at SAP. Sure. But, uh, what's been the biggest challenges for you? 
Well, I think like anything else, you you have to, and we're kind of going through this, through this exercise now in the current infrastructure work that we're doing. Um, you've got to put your customer hat on and make it as simple as possible. And even back in the HP days when we started out, you can imagine how many, there were billions of HP printers and PCs that were installed in the world and every product manager wanted their own board. And we're like, no. I mean, this is great advice from Joe Cothway. He's like, you need to start small. So I think we started the original HP forums, Word Forum in English had maybe two or four boards for printers and two or four boards for PCs. That was it. Mm -hmm. And we went out of the gate and the volume was just insane. And what happens is the customer has to drive the nature of the conversation. You're going to see new flavors of conversation emerging. Once you have scale, you can branch those off, create a new block. I think, you know, if you go to the extreme where now we're so massive and it's very complex and people come in, you know, through Google and then they have a hard time figuring out where to go next, we're actually going to be simplifying that dramatically. So I think you have to not, you know, not boil the ocean, go with a simple structure, you know, especially in the, in the smaller companies with, with both Domo and Kaltura, you get your, your salespeople, your CSMs, they know who your most passionate customers are. You don't need a community for that. They're already having those conversations. So get a small group, get five or 10 or 20 of the most passionate customers you have, get them in a room and say, Hey, we're thinking about teeing up this community. What do you think? What do we need? And they're going to give you the basics and you could start, you know, crowdsourcing a conversation, even in a, a common room or a Slack channel. And then once you realize, okay, there's massive scale here, then you look at going to a much bigger, uh, bigger platform, but you know, nothing's, there's no silver bullet here. You've got to, you know, start small, iterate, you know, it's like, it's my, my big analogy is it's like growing a garden. You're going to plant some seeds, some stuff's going to work, some stuff's not. You're going to cut it back. You're going to keep it, you know, you got to keep nurturing it and growing. Yeah, it's interesting. There's like, uh, uh, within that context, it's like some of these companies already have a brand. They already have users of your product. And so there's a community just waiting to be engaged with and to be nurtured. Ray, I'm curious for you because you have so much influence over the breadth of communities at Intel. Well, hopefully you do. Um, you're always helping launch new communities and kind of nurture and steward these community teams to build great communities. Like how do you help them scale, help set expectations on what success looks like early on, keep them motivated, all those things. Uh, well, first thing we ask them is, do you really need a community? Right. I think we, we ask them four, five, seven different questions. Why do you need a community? Do we have resources? Um, right? Uh, is this the right thing for you to do? Um, and sometimes, no. Sometimes they need something else. Sometimes they need to go to an event. Sometimes they need to partner with another group that is doing something that might, might fit their needs, right? Um, I think level setting on expectations is definitely a big uh, thing at the beginning. Um, and then the other thing that we are trying to do as a center of excellence is meet with um, everyone trying to build new communities or touching communities at Intel often. Um, we have bi-weekly calls, we are building playbooks, guidelines, training, documentation. So anyone that is interested in, in building or scaling their programs, they have some resources. Um, and sometimes in case we don't have resources, we might find someone in the company that has expertise in that particular platform or type of community. So we can then say, okay, you go and talk to this person, right? Someone here that there is, someone here has experience with what you're trying to build. So go and talk to this person. And the other thing is sometimes we just, we just don't need to create new communities, new programs. Uh, we have a lot already, right? Sometimes it's, it's about tapping into what we have. Um, so, I would say the first question is let's let's see if you really need a community, um, and then if so, then we go through that process. But for people that are actually executing and running communities, um, they might have challenges to grow and scale, which pretty much most of the time is associated with resources or a very specific uh, knowledge and expertise. And we try to find those resources or the expertise somewhere at the company. And if we can find them, uh, we build, uh, we take that project internally through the COE and we build that uh, in partnership with them. But we are trying to not just provide a bunch of documentation and training, but also help some of those people to execute, right? So in case we, uh, what's needed is not necessarily best practices. 
um, or any type of you know documentation or training, we end up executing partnership with some of those stakeholders as well. Um, so they can scale and grow their programs. Let's talk about stakeholders. There's a question that came in. It looks like there's a few people upvoting uh, qualitatively um, around how a startup can create and foster a strong sense of community among its stakeholders while still maintaining a focus on growth and financial sustainability, seeing that community is not focused on sales. So when we look at a question like that, it's clear that you have to be able to resonate with your stakeholders, keep them engaged. What are ways that like, Michael, you do a great job bringing people along and only engaging when you're ready to tell that narrative. What's one way that you've had success in kind of creating that mind share and influencing stakeholders and keeping them invested, especially since just like this question is asking is if you're not focused on sales. Mm -hmm. Are we talking about internal stakeholders, keeping them invested? Uh, I would I imagine, so. but <laughs> let's start with that. And if <laughs> more context comes out, we'll just roll with it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, one of the things that I did when I first came to Qualtrics is uh, I embarked us on a series of road shows internally to educate internal teams um, who I felt could benefit the most from community education about the value of community. And I also proposed ways in which they could get involved. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that uh, I think we touched on before, a point I was trying to make is that we are always, as community professionals, at least in my experience, in a position of uh, what I call justify your existence. And over the course of my career, I have collected a vast library of academic journal articles that I have downloaded, paid for, collected, and parsed into a spreadsheet that I have categorized. And I share that with everybody I meet with internally. And I say, this is what the research shows in right. terms of sales. This is what the research shows in terms of brand value. This is what the research shows in terms of expansion, retention, renewal. This is what the research shows um, uh, across the board in terms of all benefits. And so I share that information with everybody. I don't expect people to read uh, a 200 page academic journal article. So I did the work for them to pull out the most salient points and I, I share that with them as well. And so I think it helps to hear um, not just from me as a, as a so-called community expert that this is what's going to happen if you do community well, but for them to be able to see, oh, these major universities and organizations around the world have been studying the effects of brand communities for so long, and this is what they've found, um, that helps to um, foster a strong sense of community among internal stakeholders in terms of the value in terms of fostering a, a sense of community among our members and our, our customer community, um, a lot of that is through the personal relationships that we build with them by making sure that they're, they feel heard, that their voices are amplified, that they're getting the attention they need. Um, I saw a related question before about, uh, I think it was related to scale and uh, personalization at scale and resources, we pull from community adjacent teams to have uh, folks on, on, on in other groups help us moderate, help us uh, respond to community members. We have found that community members love it when they just feel acknowledged. Um, even if it's something as simple as thanking them for asking a question, it goes a long way. Um, I hope I answered the question. Um, if not, I'm happy to continue the conversation. I think you did more. <laughs> I think you did more. There are so many threads okay. there in terms of like contextualizing the impact of community for the stakeholder. I think one thing that a lot of community professionals do early on is they create a dashboard, but it's like engagement yeah. or growth or this or that. Yeah. And mm -hmm. it's up to the 
stakeholder to internalize what does that mean for them? Whereas what you've done is you've said, look, like here's the specific benefits that you're going to get and you've already done the legwork. So they don't even have to translate it themselves because if you imagine if you're responsible for retention or activation or this or that, how many other mm -hmm. fires do you have burning to go and right. understand something as complex as community and the interactions mm -hmm. and the anecdotes within there? It's just not going to happen. And so I think translating Correct. that value is something that clearly has helped you with your career. Yeah. I want to go for, um, I think we might have time for one more set of questions. Um, and I want to ask everybody, um, with everything we've learned, like in the industry this past year around investment in community, um, what is one thing that you're doubling down on? this year so for your community for what you plan to do one thing that you want to deliver for your organization so that not only can you be successful but the company as a whole can be and i'll start with ray um because you look like you're still a bot <laughs> <laughs> um i i would say education in in value and roi right so i think there's a lot of education that we are doing just like michael was saying um, yesterday, we ran a, a all full day uh, summit uh, for all community practitioners in Italy. We had around 100 people joining all the sessions. We had community one on one. We had an external speaker. We had for a fireside chat. We had um, we looked at you know the origin or the map of all the communities in Italy. So we we are working a lot on education to level set so we we have a common ground on what community is the benefits the value and, and how um, community can help us um, impact the business and we want to ensure and by doing that we want to ensure that community stays closer to the business right the closer we are uh, the better things will be the more aligned we'll be and the more we'll be supporting the business so that's one thing. And then the other side of the coin is showing that ROI, that value, having not just the dashboard, but the education so we can then translate and then uh, materialize the numbers that we are seeing. So there is a lot of education. There is a lot of measurement um, discussions that are happening around the different types of programs and communities. Um, and I would say those two are the most critical um, things for us at the moment. And Donnie, what about you? What, what are you doubling down on and what's the, the big rock that you're focused on? So for us, it's really this year is about um, simplification. It's really it's infrastructure. It's making a much better customer experience and putting our customer um, oriented focus on that experience. And one of the bigger initiatives across SCP are these this is simplified digital customer experience. We've got 10 gold, what they call 10 golden touch points or 10 goldies. Community is certainly seen as one of those. And so, um, you know, one login, one time across the entire ecosystem, you know, symbiotic relationship across community support, learning. Um, I think, you know, if we, we, we've got the volume, that's not the issue. We need to get a much uh, better traction in our ecosystem and our community experience. And if we do that and really move the needle on that, then everything else will follow as far as all the goodness. And so it's, Creating and simplifying that experience through better infrastructure, and then of course having a much more seamless and symbiotic relationship and experience across learning and support, because those two are intertwined with the work that we're doing uh, in community. It's interesting. Customer journey is coming up so much in conversations that we're having, and that is just a natural place where community fits in because users can enter through so many different doors today to get access to products, to understand, to learn, to evaluate and so forth. And community is just a natural landing spot for a lot of the organic conversations um, that occur. And Michael, for you, what are you doubling down on? We are doubling down on authenticity. That is a major theme for us right now. I think especially coming out of the last two years of, uh, or more, of a global pandemic, of social unrest, of environmental injustice. I think that people are looking for authentic and real connections. And our only goal is to be real and to be helpful with our customers. I think that 
This is just my sense personally, anecdotally, from what I see, people are fatigued on influencers. People are fatigued on, uh, you know, people on LinkedIn saying, follow me for 10,000 more followers. Uh, I think people are fatigued on um, everybody who claims to be an expert uh, and the competing uh, advice that comes uh, from that. So we are uh, shying away from um, positioning ourselves as really experts on anything in that regard and focusing solely on how can we help you with the job that needs to be done today. So we're creating learning content in the form of two minute tips that you can watch easily based on the most commonly asked questions. We are creating a video version of our release notes for people who don't want to read all the nitty gritty. Here's a quick summary. We're creating podcasts to have authentic and real conversations about what's top of mind for customers. So for us, it's all about authenticity. Uh, and that's what we're doubling down on. I love that. I, I was just reading a study from LinkedIn on how B2B buyers um, rated responsiveness as one of the leading reasons as to why they grow affinity to a brand and you being present, authentic, and just meeting them in that jobs to be done. It also combats the fatigue, I think, users have in having to educate themselves. There's so much data out there now mm -hmm. that shortcuts really can help them do their jobs faster and better. And I think uh, it's appreciated now more than ever. Well, yeah. folks, uh, we surpassed the time limit. I want to thank all the attendees, everybody that came in, asked questions, and especially the panelists. Uh, you all have influenced me in so many ways. I've learned so much from you all. And thank for you. you to come on and share it with us uh, means the world. Thank you. That was fun. Yeah. Uh, Thank you for having us. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Talk soon. Good community. Bye, Bye guys. Bye.